Hello and welcome. This is the second video on the MSc level program in theoretical physics, which is offered by the string theory and theoretical cosmology groups at Queen Mary. I am Dr. Sanjay Ramgulam and I work in string theory. The story of string theory starts with quantum field theory. As you know, quantum field theory is the theoretical framework underlying the standard model of part as well as the theory of inflation in cosmology. String theory explores the space of all quantum field theories, looking for hints of what lies beyond the fundamental physics that we know in particle physics and cosmology. There are a couple of important discoveries of string theory, and I'll highlight three of them. One is a new way to quantize gravity. String String theory takes on gravity by thinking about the space-time where you want to describe physics and imagining little strings that are propagate through space-time. And this one-dimensional object, as it propagates through time, sweeps out a two-dimensional surface. So string theory looks at that two-dimensional surface as an abstract surface away from space-time. And it thinks about, as a result, it is able to describe gravitons in space-time as well as their interactions, not by directly quantizing gravity in space-time, but by going to this auxiliary surface or world sheet and doing quantum field theory there. So it's actually relating quantum field theory in two dimensions to quantum gravity in the space-time you're interested in, four dimensions or ten dimensions. Actually, one second, one of the important discoveries, which is the second one I'm going to talk about, is uh, the fact that extra dimensions of space-time beyond the four that we know are actually needed in string theory. For this idea to work, to really be able to describe space-time gravity using the world sheet and its quantum fields, you need that the space-time is actually 10-dimensional. This is what you need if you want to describe space-time gravity, which is consistent with the symmetries we know, for example, Lorentz invariant. So you have 2D quantum fields, which describe 10D uh, string theory or super string theory. And there's another little twist to the story. You can actually think about the strength of different interactions, the strength of interaction between strings uh, as a parameter, which secretly is the size of another dimension. So string theory or super string theory more, pre theory more precisely exists in either 10 or 11 dimensions. Great, so quantum gravity, extra dimensions. And the third important element of string theory, one of the major discoveries in the 90s, brings these two aspects together. And this is the ADS-CFT correspondence. So the ADS stands for a particular kind of 10-dimensional space-time, which includes anti sitter space, ADS, and CFT is for conformal field theory, uh, which in fact is about conformal quantum field theory. So it's a special kind of quantum field theory. It exists in four dimensions. And what ADS CFT says is that these four dimensional quantum field theories are equivalent to 10 dimensional string theory. And the string theory being a string theory it is a theory of quantum gravity. It exists in 10 dimensions. On the other hand, this, th this other theory, this dual theory, which is quantum field theory in uh, four dimensions, is a theory with conformal symmetry. This is a kind of symmetry that involves scaling of space-time coordinates. So you have conformal quantum field theory uh, in four dimensions. Uh, which in fact does not include gravity. So this 4D theory include gravity in any obvious sense. It's a kind of theory like QCD, the theory that describes quarks and gluons, uh, except it has many, many gluons. So it's called a large N uh, CFT, conformal field theory. So here you, we have a four dimensional theory with many, many gluons, uh, no explicit gravitons, but it turns out the physics described by this uh, 
four-dimensional theory is equivalent to ten-dimensional string theory with all its baggage of quantum gravity and exciting stuff, well, black holes and all that. It comes from this four-dimensional large-n quantum field theory. That's the ADS-CFT correspondence. Two different theories that don't look uh, alike at all are actually equivalent. If you look at the physical observables on the two, two sides, they are the same. You can map from one side to the other. The big question in ADS-CFT is how, is how does this four-dimensional quantum field theory know, and how does it hide this 10-dimensional string theory? In other words, how does the 10-dimensional physics emerge from four-dimensional quantum fields? My own work approaches this question using algebras which are associated with symmetries in the problem. One symmetry we already talked about, the scaling symmetry, which is related to conformal symmetry in the quantum field theory, scaling coordinates. Um, so that's an obvious symmetry. When you write down the theory, you see conformal symmetries there. Uh, there is another kind of obvious or manifest symmetry in the problem. Uh, as we said, there are large numbers of gluons in this CFTs. When you have large numbers of gluons, you also have a large symmetry, which is called a gauge symmetry. So you have a large gauge symmetry. The thing about gauge symmetries is that it's a funny sort of symmetry. It is actually a redundancy in your variables. Two things related by, to each other by gauge symmetry are actually describing the same physics. So to do physics in gauge theory, it is important to isolate the gauge invariant quantity. So for example, if you have many element fields, scalars, fermions, gauge fields, out of these elementary fields, you can build composite fields. Okay. And these composite fields, you can ask which of these composites are gauge invariant. So there's an interesting combinatorics of gauge invariant um, objects in this uh, CFT. So it turns out when you try to understand the combinatorics of these gauge invariants, there's yet another symmetry that comes up. And it's a hidden sort of symmetry. It's not manifest in the action or whatever. It's a hidden symmetry, and it's a discrete symmetry of permutations. Turns out. So we start with uh, conformal field theory with gluons and associated uh, gauge symmetry, which is a continuous symmetry. Actually, it's a symmetry of complex rotations in a large dimension. Uh, that's the kind of gauge symmetry that we have. So it's a continuous symmetry. But when you're looking at the invariance of the symmetry, which are the important physical things, there's this hidden symmetry, which is discrete permutation symmetries. Okay. So uh, it's very interesting because uh, in studying CFTs, what we're finding is that you have the continuous manifest symmetries and you have the hidden symmetries. So there's a duality between manifest and hidden. In fact, these are known mathematical dualities called sure via duality. So in a way, this big duality, the physical duality between uh, string theory and CFT has sort of a mathematical avatar, uh, which is a smaller, better understood mathematical duality between hidden symmetries and manifest symmetries. So, so how do you use these hidden symmetries in order to understand the emergence of the 10-dimensional physics from the four-dimensional physics? That's the kind of thing that is a predominant part of my research. Another aspect of my research has to do with using this mathematics of invariant theory, dualities, permutations, and so on, and applying it to something called random matrix theory. So a random matrix theory is a theory that is based on integration over large matrices. Okay. So it connects with the ADS-CFT discussion because when you have many gluons, you have large matrices. Okay, so when you're integrating over large matrices, there's some fairly simple integrals you can write down. And it was discovered by Wigner and Dyson that uh, you can use these matrix integration models called random matrix theories to describe complexity, to describe 
expected compt energy levels of complicated nuclei to describe the statistics of the energy levels of complex nuclei. Okay. Uh, so, it's, so there's a kind of a connection between matrix models or random matrix theories and uh, statistical distributions in complex systems, for example, nuclei. And in fact, since their work, uh, people have found that uh, you can use random matrix theory to describe statistics in complex systems of various sorts, whether it's finance, biostatistics, and so on. So one of my recent uh, lines of work is to look at matrix theories with uh, permutation symmetries and solve them using techniques on quantum field theory and representation theory and apply these theories to um, data, in particular the kind of uh, system where this kind of matrix model is very useful when you have these discrete permutation symmetries is to describe data coming from language. Uh, so there is a whole subject in uh, computer science, more specifically computational linguistics, which is called distributional semantics, where you look at large collections of text and you code a lot of the information in that large collection of text using a collection of matrices. Uh, these are different matrices are associated with different words. So when you have a collection of many matrices, there's a randomness there. How do you model that randomness? So one of the things we found recently is that uh, matrix models with permutation symmetry are able to capture some of the characteristics of this randomness. So in the context of the master's programs, I teach the module Advanced Quantum Field Theory, which develops canonical quantization, discusses gauge symmetry, derives Feynman rules from the combinatorics of weak contractions for theories like QED and other related theories. And it also includes an introduction to the theory of renormalization. How do you systematically set up perturbation theory in order to make sure that some of the infinities that you encounter when you first you just do things naively can be controlled. So that's the theory of renormalization. So advanced quantum field theory includes an introduction to that. So within the context of the master's programs, I'm happy to discuss master's uh, projects on the mathematics of ADS-CFP, on random matrix theories and their applications. To conclude, I'd just like to say that uh, the string theory group uh, at Queen Mary is very large. There are 15 string theorists. Our research areas span many different corners of string theory. It's interfaces with particle physics, cosmology, and mathematics. And uh, doing a master's here is an exciting prospect.